I, I'm Sarah Gill. I'm a physician scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I uh, co-chaired the session on CLL at today's W CART uh, meeting. The session on CLL was uh, very exciting because it brought together several investigators, both uh, clinical as well as lab investigators, to uh, tell the audience um, and to discuss with one another the latest updates in CAR T-cell for CLL. So um, I have with me today Dr. Jordan Gortier from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, as well as Dr. Tanya Siddiqui from the City of Hope in California. And um, I will ask, actually, uh, Dr. Gautier to start off by summarizing what you found in your um, combination uh, trial. So what we've done is we carried out a, a small pilot study, and we um, did a retrospective analysis between patients who were receiving ibrutinib concurrently uh, at the time of leukapheresis through lymphoid depletion and CAR T-cell therapy, and had to continue on ibrutinib uh, for at least uh, three months after the infusion of the T-cells. And when we compare these patients to patients who had stopped ibrutinib um, prior to lymphoid depletion, we observed, we observed that they had um, obtained still very high response rates, um, but with significantly lower uh, severity of toxicity, and in particular, cytokine release syndrome. And uh, this was very interesting uh, for us because even though the disease burden was lower in pati patients uh, receiving concurrent uh, ibrutinib, the in vivo expansion of the CAR T cells was comparable, if not higher, for the CD4 positive subset. And um, finally, we also looked at uh, a range of different cytokines that are strongly associated with severe uh, cytokine release syndromes. And many of those were at uh, significantly lower uh, concentrations compared to patients who uh, had stopped ibrutinib. Okay, thanks, Jordan. So I was wondering, what, what is the background to this? Tanya, I was wondering if you could tell us what, what the field is doing in terms of CAR T cells for CLL that perhaps led to uh, consideration of combination therapy? Sure. Um, so CLL, as you know, is, is an evolving field in terms of therapies. There's a lot of novel treatments out there that um, do seem to work well for most patients, um, but there are a subset of patients with poor risk features who may not respond for too long with novel agents like ibrutinib or venetoclax and what have you, and, and they run out of options. And so CAR T cells are being tried in patients to see if you can get more durable long-term remissions um, in even the poor risk patients. So the Transcend CLL um, 004 study that um, um, I've been leading um, and we talked about at this IW CAR T cell meeting here in Miami today um, basically is a phase one um, study that uh, we, we checked two dose levels and um, it, the, the CAR T cells are given in a one-to-one -one fashion with CD4 and CD8 positive CAR T cells um, just to be able to give equal doses and have potentially equal expansion um, uh, and uh, more predictable responses and toxicity profiles and we've treated up to about 23 patients thus far on this phase one um, uh, in this phase one setting. And what we found is that uh, uh, patients have had very early uh, responses at the 30-day mark, um, MRD undetectable remissions um, up to 60 to 70 percent by flow uh, as well as by, uh, by flow in peripheral blood as well as by next generation sequencing in bone marrow. And, um, and in a, a lot of these patients, these MRD undetectable responses seem to be fairly durable. We've had the longest follow-up up to about 15 months or so in, in some of these patients, and they still appear to be in, uh, in a good remission. And then the other good thing is that these uh, lysocell CAR T cells um, that we're using uh, basically cause pretty much um, no um, grade four cytokine release syndrome on this trial. Only a couple patients had grade three cytokine release syndrome. And neurotoxicity was also similarly only in about five of 23 patients with grade three or four neurotoxicity. So very well tolerated, easily manageable toxicities, reversible for the most part. And, um, and again, like I said, efficacy looks really good. Very early, deep responses, which seem to be durable thus far. So very exciting, um, and then based on this and other data that shows that ibrutinib combinations might actually improve upon these results even further, this particular trial has a cohort of patients um, combining ibrutinib with um, JCAR-17 or lysocell, and then that's what um, Jordan talked about in his own study with the combination as well. So more things to look forward to. Thank you. Uh, to zoom out a little bit, 
healthcare providers who are maybe watching this or, or treating people with CLL, when do you think they should refer their patients for consideration of CAR T-cell therapy? Could you, could you start? Well, I, I can certainly say that uh, the earlier the better, because um, uh, the less beaten up the patient is, I think the better they will respond um, to CAR T-cell, better they'll tolerate CAR T-cells. Um, and so uh, ideally, it would be nice if it's high-risk patients who have failed, let's say, brutinib therapy or one line of novel agent therapy, as refer them early so we can see how quickly we can take them to CAR T-cells to get a more durable response. That would be my um, recommendation. Jordan, are there any patient populations that, or, or subsets of patients with CLL that you think you would not want to try CAR T-cells in or, or ones that, that, that perhaps you would think would not be advisable on the basis of potentially side effects or conversely uh, lack of efficacy? I think we had that very interesting uh, conversation is that the field is moving so quickly in CLL and the results that we're seeing now, in particularly in the upfront setting with combination with brutinib venetoclax, uh, can, can lead to very high rates of uh, MRD negative responses and uh, durable responses as well. So obviously, I think that we really need to distinguish patients who, who are FCR refractory, multi-treated. And I think in this case, obviously, CD19 CAR T-cells are, I think, a very reasonable options. Is that option still as good in, in the upfront setting uh, given the recent data, uh, we, particularly with the uh, combination therapies with venetoclax, uh, I think it's still a little, little bit unclear. I think what I would add is that on the Transend CLL004 study that I was talking about, the eligibility criteria are everybody has to have failed BTK inhibitor therapy, so everybody had failed um, abrutinib. And then what we saw was more than 50% had also progressed on venetoclax or were progressing on venetoclax when they came onto our study. So just, um, just um, as a patient population, you know, we're, that's the kind of patients we're looking at currently. Thank you. And in terms of risk factors, we know, I think, very well that having um, deletion 17P or otherwise aberrations of, of P53 related to P53 uh, confer a, a poor prognosis with regards to chemotherapy and even a poorer prognosis um, in the setting of ibrutinib therapy. Is there any evidence that that... Um, adverse risk factor has any role to play in response to CAR T-cells? At this point, no. From the 23 patients that we've treated on the um, Transcend CLL004 trial, majority of patients did have poor risk features, uh, whether it was deletion 17P or, you know, unmutated IGVH or complex karyotype or what have you. And across the board, so far, and of course we have to do a more robust subset analysis subsequently, but so far it looks like there's no distinction between uh, the different um, uh, risk categories in terms of responses. I mean, our study is a little tricky because 90% of patients were high risk with either and or 17P deletion and or complex karyotype. So the, the subgroup of patients like, would, that would be low risk cytogenetics is probably a very, very, like a handful of patients. So they're doing this analysis, but we've, we've seen deep and durable responses in patients with very high risk cytogenetics. So it looks like maybe this, these prognostic factors are maybe not as impacting after CAR T cell therapy. Are you treating patients outpatient or inpatient, and how long do they remain inpatient? For, on this particular trial, the patients would be treated initially outpatient and would be admitted um, in the occurrence of fever or any, any symptoms, uh, and uh, in particular, that would indicate a cytokine release syndrome. And, and, and then the, I, could, I don't remember the exact duration, the median duration of hospitalization. Um, it was probably in the 10, maybe the 10 to 15 day uh, range in case of toxicity. So we had, particularly in this, in this pilot study, we haven't seen any very severe toxicity. So most patients could be discharged uh, very quickly. I think on the Transcend CLL uh, study, I personally haven't treated majority of patients in the outpatient setting um, just because of logistic issues, but we certainly have the capability. I've treated a few outpatient. Uh, I know at the Hutch, um, Dave Maloney, et cetera, have treated a lot more outpatient and kept them outpatient. Um, uh, from uh, related lymphoma trials uh, with the Juno uh, product, uh, I think about 40% patients have been treated outpatient at, at various um, sites. So that goes to you know speak uh, to how well tolerated the product generally is. Uh, 
Uh, even if people do need to be admitted for cytokine release syndrome or fevers or what have you, my general sense is it's a much shorter admission than if you were to admit somebody for the full, you know, CAR T and follow up and all that kind of um, uh, the first couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. And I think that what it becomes apparent, I guess, is apparent to us because that's what we do is that. Um, a cytokine release syndrome admission isn't necessarily a super urgent one. So at least in, in, in my experience, in our experience, patients who develop CRS, and, and I'm talking about 4-1-BB co-stimulated CAR T cells, that is not necessarily, doesn't happen necessarily the next day after right. infusion. And when it does, generally this is a progressive syndrome, if it is progressive, rather than an immediate acute uh, and, and potentially severe hypotensive event. It's usually a bad hypoxia. sign if it, uh, if it happens early on yes. and yeah. the patient deteriorate yeah. uh, very quickly. Yes. And in CLL right. specifically, my general sense is it's fever and chills is the most common side effect, mm -hmm. and it usually happens anywhere from five to six days after CAR T cells, seems to be my sense. So to sum up, where do both of you think we'll be with, with CLL treatment using CAR T cells, say, in a year or two? Where would you like us to be? In CLL. In CLL, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I mean, I, I would like us to see it being used earlier in the course of treatment. Um, and maybe you can comment a little bit more about this uh, in terms of you know, cost effectiveness in the long run. Um, because currently, we're using things like abrutinib and venetoclax. If they're used as monotherapy sort of never-endingly. Um, the combinations are, are expensive, but, um, but maybe time-limited. And where CAR T cells will fit in to try to see if you can cure patients before they need to be on these expensive novel agents forevermore. Um, yeah, look, I think to me the point is that CLL is, is not uncommon. Um, and there is an identifiable patient population at high risk. But even if it isn't, once patients need treatment, are you committing them to a life, potentially, or right now at least, the, the state of the art is that you are committing them to a lifelong oral treatment with a substantial incidence of side effects. Um, that, of course, we know, though that is not well described in CLL, but we know that a chronic oral therapy in someone who doesn't necessarily have a lot of symptoms is then associated with lack of compliance, et cetera, et cetera, and in, at least in this country, a significant financial toxicity, mm -hmm. both to the patient as well as to the taxpayer or right, to, the, right. to the other insured patients. And so, uh, personally, where I would like to see the field of CLL uh, treatment moving is having a step for, for, for decades now, we've been saying CLL is incurable. Well, I think, mm -hmm. and this is controversial, of course, and, and, and a pretty short uh, follow-up. Right. So, so, well, I would say the longest follow-up for CLL treatment with CAR T cells is now nine years right. or so in, right. in a handful of patients. And so there certainly are a, a group of patients who are um, MRD negative for many, many years now. And so I think what I would like us all to think about is can we, number one, bring the treatment earlier in the, in the course of treatment? And can we just dream a little? Can mm -hmm. we just dream a little and, and be a little bit more ambitious and say, can we just get rid of this, of this, uh, if, of this disease with the Altogether. tools that, as you guys um, laid out, aren't necessarily that toxic? The side effects certainly occur, but aren't necessarily that toxic. OK, well, thank you both very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.